Thank you very much. President Kerwin and Provost Bast and D Dean Goldgeier, members of the faculty, staff, distinguished guests, parents, families, my good friend and chairman of the CIS Dean's Council, Alan Fleischman. Please first join me in congratulating the American University School of International Service Class of 2015. But today, today we must first celebrate the women in our lives, the ones who have nurtured us, challenged us to do more and be better, and taught us to do the right thing. These women are our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts, our friends, our co-workers, mentors, and anyone who felt maternal. And they make a difference in our lives every day with big and small gestures and through the best and worst of times. So for the class of 2015, please stand and thank your mothers. It truly is magical to be here today on this stage, in this auditorium. It was here a little over seven years ago that the late great Senator Ted Kennedy and his niece, the now Ambassador Carolyn Kennedy, endorsed a young senator from Illinois for the presidency. And they provided crucial support at a critical moment in the campaign, and that moment spurred the momentum that carried Barack Obama into the White House. <laughs> President Obama's victory was particularly meaningful to me. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, the second son, all right, Denver, of two parents with two PhDs in what had become the newly desegregated America. As a child, I would come to Washington, D.C. to visit my grandparents and my aunts and my cousins and my grandfather made a career at the U.S. Postal Service. But when he was in his late teens, he worked for the United States Congress in the Senate lounge. That's where he checked hats and coats and poured coffee and tea for senators and other dignitaries. Many years later, my grandfather and I decided we should attend President Obama's first inauguration ceremony. So at the age of 93, he walked over four hours that day to and from the ceremony with a great smile, a full heart, and without complaint. And as we sat there that frigid January morning as guest of Senator Ted Kennedy, our breath smoking in the chilly winter cold air, my granddad told me a story about another inauguration he had witnessed, that of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He pointed up at a window he said, do you see that window, the small American flag draped underneath it? I said, yeah. And from our angle, it was right over the left shoulder of where President Obama would, or President-elect Obama would take his oath of office. He said, I remember being in that lounge and gazing out during the inauguration of President Roosevelt. And it dawned on him, a fact that, dawned, that, that he was the only African-American face that he saw. And this was a time when our country was struggling for human rights and for people to be full citizens of this country. His words poured over me. His words poured over us. And as we sat there shivering that day, about to watch the first African-American take, take the oath of office for President of the United States, what struck me was not how much the world had changed since FDR's time in, in my grandfather's lifetime or the accelerated chase of pain, uh, pace of change in this country. You have to remember, I spent my life at the confluence of technology and finance, and I was accustomed to warp speed transformation and mind-blowing change. But what I marveled at that day was how Barack Obama had the courage in the timeless words of another Kennedy, the great Senator and Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy to imagine things that never were and ask, why not? What is true is that we are only bound by the limits of our own conviction. We can transcend the script of a predefined story.
and pave the way for, for a future that we design. We just need to tap into that power, that conviction, and that determination within us. And as I look upon you, this class of 2015, I see before me the cis tradition of diversity on stunning display. I see graduates from more than 100 countries, every continent, different religions, different academic interests, and different plans for the future. But the thing that unites you all is the common glue of your instinct to serve, your shared understanding that you have a unique role to play in this world. And to affect change and live the ethic of service that is built in this school's DNA, you must bridge who you are with who you can be by running your own race. Let me tell you what I mean by that. And I'm going to share the story of a very famous racehorse called Secretariat. My grandfather and I used to go to the horse races all the time together. But 42 years ago next month, Secretariat galloped to victory at the Belmont Stakes. And he captured the final leg of the Triple Crown, becoming the first horse in 25 years or so to achieve that great feat. He was a three-year-old thoroughbred, and he captured the minds of a nation. And even as a 10-year-old boy growing up in Colorado, I was captivated by this story. And having sprinted to victory in the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness, he was favored to win the Belmont Stakes, but there were some doubters. Even though it's the longest of the races and everyone thought he was just a sprinter and not really built for longer distances, Secretariat knew better. He opened the race by exploding out of the gate and drove himself forward to command an enormous lead. And he kept growing that lead with every stride. He wasn't looking to his left. He wasn't looking to his right. He wasn't worried about his challengers. He looked straight ahead. And even when he was 28 lengths ahead, he kept surging forward, racing against himself, running his own race. And by the time he finished and crossed that finish line, he had won by 31 lengths. 31 lengths. You can win by one length. Why win by 31 lengths? Because the lesson is as follows. There is no greater test of ourselves and no greater reward than to compete against our own potential. And it is incumbent upon you, the class of 2015, to run your own race. And when I talk about running your own race, what do I really mean? Every story is going to be different. The ingredients are going to be different. But I'm going to give you an illustration of what running your own race, just by giving you some sense of my career and the path in my career. And the first and foremost important thing about running your own race is dreaming big. And here I'm called back to my childhood when I was just starting elementary school. At that point in time, the Supreme Court had just ruled that public school districts could pursue desegregation by using forced busing to achieve racial balance in their schools. In fact, I started my own education as a first grader being bused to a school across town, even though my father was a principal at a school five blocks away. Although I was a live subject in one of the nation's most controversial legal debates, I frankly didn't know what the big deal was all about, because these kids who didn't look like me sure acted just like me. But desegregation was a big deal to my parents, and leaders of their generations knew, a great, knew that great change was in store, and it was the right thing to do and they often met with resistance and often violent resistance. But because of their struggle, their sacrifice, I received a great gift, and that's the gift to dream big. I knew my history. I remembered the pride of my mother telling about when she took me and my brother, brought us back to Washington, D.C., and held me as a nine-month-old during the March on Washington, when Martin Luther King laid out his dream for equal and harmonious meritocratic America. And dreaming big to me meant knowing my history, but not being bound by it. It meant harnessing the past to drive me into the future. It meant grounding myself in who I was and where I came from, so I could soar to become who I wanted to become. So to me, the first part of running your own race is dreaming big, and the second part is challenging yourself and being persistent. 
I went to the same high school in East Denver as my father did, Denver East High School, and I remember taking a computer science course. And at the time, they introduced this thing called a transistor, which is the building block of computers, for those who don't, knew, don't know. And transistors were invented at this place called Bell Labs, which had a facility about 20, 20 miles from my home. And after that lesson, I went and I dug up the, the telephone number to the Bell Labs facility and I called them. I said, do you have summer internships? They said, we absolutely do. I said, fantastic. They said, if you're between your junior and senior year in college. I said, hey, I'm a junior in high school. I'm taking advanced math classes and computer science, getting all A's, just like being in college. <laughs> they said, no, it isn't. <laughs> so I called every day for two weeks straight. The HR director, of course, stopped taking the calls after the second day. And I left the message with my phone number. Then I called every Monday for five months. And every time I called, the receptionist just chuckled. And she took my name, and she took my number, and she said, we'll get back to you if there's an opening. And I kept at it. And to my surprise, the human resources director called my house in June and said, listen, an intern from MIT didn't show up. We have an extra slot. We're not promising you anything, but why don't you come on in and interview? Now, of course, I knew I was the most qualified candidate for this job. <laughs> and the truth is, I went in, I interviewed, I got the job. Now, it probably wasn't because I was the most qualified candidate. It's probably I was the only one that had a valid telephone number for it because this was before the age of cell phones and messaging systems. So the important thing that I want you to think about here is the persistence to get that job led to me working at Bell Labs for the next four years, becoming a co-op student, and ultimately finishing with a degree in chemical engineering from Cornell, all from being persistent. That's where the next part of running your race is important. I call it discovering the joy of figuring things out. So when I got to Bell Labs, they shared offices, and I happened to share offices with a PhD in chemical engineering. And this man had patents that were probably 30 pages long. And he'd become one of my first mentors. And on my first day at work, as we got settled into his office, he turned his chair around, he kind of looked me up and down, and held this computer chip in front of me and said, this is an operational amplifier. It's failing in our Merlin systems out there in the field. You need to figure out why it's, why it's failing so we can fix it. If you have any questions, ask me. And then he turns around. And so you see, unlike today's technically sophisticated high school students, I had no idea what an operational amplifier was, what it was supposed to do, what this one didn't do. And so before the days of Google and Wikipedia, we had this thing called a library. And, we, and I went to the library, and I pulled every book on operational amplifiers I could find. I talked to everyone in the halls who would listen and ask questions. And by the end of the summer, not only did I have an idea about why this wasn't working, but I had built a system that, st that simulates the field conditions that causes them to fail. And then with my mentor's help, help we fixed the problem. My guess is even now, I'm probably the most knowledgeable intern at Bell Labs on operational amplifiers in the history of that company. But the important thing was the challenge from my mentor was more than to teach me something about this obscure integrated circuit. It's a challenge that has reaped rich dividends for me over my entire career. It is the joy of figuring things out. And so as you depart today, I hope that as you embrace life and engage in complex problems, that you actually discover that joy of figuring things out. And as you're listening to, and as you're out there challenging this world, start to listen to your own voice. That's the next lesson. Running your own race demands trusting yourself even when others don't. Because guess what? There are a lot of people, good people, people who love you, who trust you, and who you love and trust who want the best for you. And you'll come to them with some ideas about what you want to do and how you want to do it, and they're going to say, that's crazy. Just like when I left my first engineering job, 
at Kraft, and I was telling my grandfather I was going back to business school, and he said, that's a great paying job, that's crazy. And when I finished business school and decided to join the tumultuous world of investment banking, my friends and my family and my, it was, spoke up with concerns about my sanity. And when I left Goldman Sachs right after we'd gone public to set up a private equity firm called Vista, my mentors and colleagues at Goldman Sachs thought I was crazy. And to top it all off, when I told them I'm going to start a firm, we're going to focus on enterprise software and not be diversified like all other private equity firms, I was going to hire a team of smart, young, talented people who'd never done this before. Everyone knew I was certifiable. And I did this, of course, in the spring of 2000, about two months before the entire tech bubble crashed. Well, all I can tell you is I've never been mad at these folks. In fact, I'm grateful for their advice and their concern. Because in their caution, I found my courage. In their doubts, I found my resolve. And in their warning, warnings, I found my voice and chartered my own journey. And I'm proud of the Vista story. We take risks, we do things differently, and we listen to our own voice, we run our own race, and it has worked. We are now considered to be the number one private equity firm on the planet, and have been so for the last decade. And while that may seem like a charming story, a one in a million type story, our approach is quickly shifting the landscape from exception to rule and from option to necessity as people are realizing the way we do it is a better way to do it. And that changing world that I live in, that you live in, has important implications for you. To distinguish yourself today, you have to run towards change, not away from it. You have to embrace it and not shirk from it, and you have to run your own race and embrace the rapid change that characterizes our modern world. The world we inhabit today is fundamentally different from the one in which I grew up in when I was your age. For instance, my undergraduate year, the big thing on campus my freshman year was an ATM machine. Wow, you mean my parents can deposit money across the country and I can take it out with a four-digit code and I don't have to call them and justify it? That's pretty cool if you can keep that train going. But we didn't trust these machines, of course. You took every receipt and every month, you figured out if the, if the bank took an extra 50 cents out of your account, which mattered at the time. But today, you all can sit in, on your smartphones and transfer money and, and you know, <laughs> uh, leverage your parents' balance sheets without them even knowing it. But that's just a small example. I think what's important is the world is changing so rapidly that the dynamic of change has changed itself. The world I live in, in enterprise software, the speed of change is mind-blowing. Words, thoughts, ideas now move at the speed of light across the planet. The dynamic of human intention can impact millions in seconds and mobilize millions in minutes, and you can touch billions over the course of days. So what's this mean for you? It means that the purity of your intention, the integrity of your purpose, has the utmost importance, not only for you and for those around you, but for billions of people you've never even met. Your every action and intention reverberates across the world, joining with other reverberations to form a seismic wave of impact. Your intentions have to be thought through because their implications ricochet around our world at the speed of light. This has profound significance for what you will need to do to succeed going forward. The pace of change in the world today, today demands originality. It demands you run your own race. You have to look ahead, not behind. Convention won't cut it anymore. To succeed, you need to step up, to be original, to overcome fear, and not to escape it. And as leaders, you will need a system of support to gather and analyze information and help you make difficult decisions. You have to prepare yourself and your colleagues for the new normal of accelerated change and to anticipate shifts before they occur. You have to lead our world as it rapidly evolves. But the single most important part of succeeding today, the single most important part of running and winning your own race is to recognize that you are enough. 
You are enough. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have humility. What it means is you should have a destiny. I'm here to tell you by you, the virtue of you being here today and walking across this stage means you are enough. Because of your time and the foundation you've received at CIS, you are enough to lead in a new way, to design elegant solutions to the world's biggest and most complex problems. You have the instinct to serve, the skills to succeed. In fact, the skills you have cross a number of areas, and the important part of using these skills is to integrate those skills. The future will be written by those who integrate the whole being. Today, that's a big part of your challenge that you must embrace. Now, I've taken you through what I found to be the most important parts of running your own race. First one, dreaming big. Second, challenge yourself in being, being persistent. The third, discover the joy of figuring things out. The fourth, listening to your own voice. The fifth, racing toward and embracing change. And lastly, and most importantly, recognize that you are enough. That's the recipe. But here's the call to action. You must use your skills and your knowledge and your instincts to serve to go change the world in only the way that you can. Grab a hold of your noble intentions. Let them expand into the universe of action. A life contained is no life at all. You are enough to create ripples of change that bend the arc of humanity closer to justice. And with the events that just unfolded in Baltimore, 38 miles from here, it's clear now more than ever that reaching your potential, no matter who you are and where you come from, matters. In fact, in 1966, Robert F. Kennedy visited South Africa and made a very powerful speech about the injustice of apartheid. And rather than deliver a discourse of despair, Senator Kennedy used his words to invoke the power in every human spirit and the power we all have within us to shape our better world. And as he put it, few have the greatness to bend history itself. But each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all these acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from the number, numberless, diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. And each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve upon the lots of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different synergies, or centers of energy and daring, these ripples build. And they build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. His words echo across the ages and ring true today. And with the transmission of technology, the rapidity of change, and your ripple moves far and quickly in today's world. So every intention, every action, every word counts. So at the conclusion of today's ceremony, each of you will receive a copy of Bobby Kennedy's Ripple of Hope speech as a gift from me. And I want you to frame it. I want you to learn it. I want you to live it. And remember, you are enough. In fact, you are everything. We need you, and we're counting on you to become each of you, one of a kind. And let the race you run become a ripple of hope that cascades out into humanity as a symbol of hope and strength for the world. Thank you very much for inviting me today.